Hi, morning everyone. Um, we're going to take, um, as you mentioned, a step away from the um, lower lakes into New South Wales into a bit of a wider discussion about ecosystem services more generally. So this comes out of um, some PhD work I've been doing around ecosystem service dynamics um, in response to hydrological regimes. So um, our study catchment is the lower Murrumbidgee. It's a um, Murray-Darling Basin subcatchment in New South Wales. We're in particularly interested in the lower part of the Murrumbidgee just before the confluence with the Murray River. Um, also known as the Low Bidgee, this is a semi-arid floodplain and it's um, the home to the largest river red gum site in New South Wales. A lot goes on in the Murrumbidgee, there's lots of competing water demands. Um, it's home to the Murrumbidgee Irrigation District and the Calambly Irrigation District. There's also a source for potable and domestic water supply as well as environmental water. On the environmental side of things, um, there are a lot of stresses in the lower Murrumbidgee. The floodplain is considerably reduced compared to its natural state. Um, the remnant vegetation there is considerably water stressed, particularly during the Millennium Drought, and it's in recovery right now. Um, also, they have significant water quality concerns. So, as recently as um, March 2016, there was a red alert for blue-green algae just downstream of Hay, which is upstream of our catchment area. And what this all amounts to is there's multiple ecosystem services, sometimes in competing and sometimes in complementary um, combinations. So if you're not familiar about ecosystem services, this is a quick rundown. So essentially ecosystem services attempts to bridge the world between the natural sciences and economics. It's nothing new to ecologists who know that the environment has a value and this attempts to put a put some kind of number on that value, typically in, in, in terms of dollars. So the cascade goes um, in its most basic form. The environment has functions, processes, structures that generate some kind of, some kind of benefit. From that benefit, we uh, some kind of service, and as humans, we perceive that as a benefit. So in flood-dependent ecosystems, we suggest that these structures um, and processes are driven primarily by a change in hydrology. And in particular, we're talking about um, flood frequency and flood volume in our case. So um, just quickly, something that I want to point out why ecosystem services are really um, quite applicable in this case is because it takes a step away from a traditional economic valuation approach that would say, this asset is worth this amount of dollars. Now we know that there's a marginal value in terms of environmental water. For example, if you look at my um, example here, a wetland watered with a 1500 gigalitre flood in a timely manner generates considerable more ecosystem services than if we delivered that flood past the desired return interval. So this, this has implications. It says that an asset is not the same amount, is not worth the same amount in all cases. Which leads us to our objective, which is to simulate how this value changes temporally. Um, and to understand baseline what the ecosystem services are and how they might change if we begin to reallocate water to the environment. So to do this, we um, construct a hydroeconomic model. We begin with um, a really simple water balance of the Murrumbidgee catchment with two nodes, um, two dam nodes and inflows, outflows, um, evaporative losses. What I want to point out here um, is that our definition of environmental water we call environmental water anything left in the river, plus return flows, plus anything we allocate. So under baseline conditions, we, don't, we have a 0% allocation. Now, what we, we're interested in three ecosystem services, and this is by no means um, exhaustive, but they're kind of on the top of our radar because they're easily quantifiable. We're interested in carbon storage in floodplain river red gums. Um, their erosion prevention uh, abilities along the riparian corridor, which are a direct function of their health. We know that um, healthy trees store more carbon than lying on the ground dead trees. Likewise, um, healthy riparian vegetation has a greater bank stabilizing effect than, than bare or unhealthy riparian vegetation. So that links back to the, the two um, hydrological indicators we're interested in, which is volume and frequency. We're also interested in um, blue-green algae prevention, which is a function of um, flow conditions. In this case, we're looking at flow velocity. Um, blue-green algae tends to form when there's very low flow or stagnant flow, 
and there's uh, high evaporation, high heat, lots of thermal stratification. And with these three ecosystem services, we, we end up with um, being able to value them in terms of human well-being and, and economic value. So um, just a definition, um, that, so everyone's on the same page. We understand that there's a lot of things that contribute to um, river red gum health. Uh, but there's something inescapable here, and that's what we really want to nail down to, is that floodplain trees need floods. And if you don't have a flood, then taking, um, ignoring the fact that different trees have different access to groundwater, if there's no flood, then the, that tree health is going to decline. So based on this, we define a four-state um, model for river red gum health. So it's either um, steady state, it's maintained at health, or it's dead, it's completely dead. Um, it can be unhealthy and declining. This occurs when um, a flood QI is delivered um, past the desired return period for that flood. And if that flood is delivered before a point where the tree dies, it can be increasing again. So this is our, um, we, we know these desired return periods and the flows from the um, Murray-Darling Basin Authority's um, environmental water requirements for the low Bidji. And of course, I'm sure everyone's familiar with kind of the conceptual representation of what this is down in the right-hand corner. So we go ahead and mathematically try and parameterize these models, these quite simple equations with what we know about how tree health declines and how it grows, what carbon is stored in, in which cases. From a nearby catchment, we have uh, carbon storage volumes per hectare. And so what we can say is that there's essentially a, a three-stage equation that we can incorporate into our model um, in regards to carbon storage. We go ahead and do the same for erosion prevention. We, um, of course, uh, healthy trees stabilize banks by reinforcing the substrate. And so for um, bare, healthy, um, healthy vegetation and also unhealthy vegetation, and based on catchment properties, we, uh, we find out the erosion, expected erosion rate for the low bidgey catchment, and as a result, we design the minimum riparian corridor that should be required to help stabilize those banks and prevent erosion. To do this, um, if we consider that riparian vegetation for the whole uh, length of catchment, it ends up with about 851 hectares of riparian vegetation, which can be inundated quite easily with just over a 45 gigalitre a year flood. So looking um, down how we parameterize that as in a mathematical equation, we assumed bank erosion is going to be zero when we have healthy trees. Of course, this is not always true. Bank erosion happens um, in all cases. And if the trees are, um, if the flood is not delivered in a timely manner to maintain the health of these trees, then we expect to see um, a decrease in bank stabilization proportional to the tree health along this riparian corridor. And lastly, our um, freshwater ecosystem service, which is the blue-green algae, this is quite a simple one. We know that um, uh, for blue-green algae conditions to be prevented, there needs to be a minimum flow velocity. So this flow velocity for, we've borrowed this from the Darling River, um, the minimum flow velocity is 0.03 meters per second. So using upstream uh, daily historic daily flow data, we, um, we develop a model to express how we think um, the flow velocity would be per month and identify critical months where, and of course, blue-green algae conditions as binary indicators, zero when that minimum flow condition is not met, and one, oh sorry, one when it's not met, and zero when it, when it is. So now we have the fun task, once we've defined these mathematically, we have the fun task of trying to value them. Thankfully, with carbon, that's quite an easy task. It's traded on the market in some places around the world. Um, we used $23, which was the announced price for the carbon tax legislation in 2012. And so this gives us a really, uh, a really neat way to say if we know how much a river red gum is inundated and how much it stores when it's healthy, times that by our value, we get a, real, we get a rough but approximate value of what that floodplain is worth in dollar values. We can do something similar with erosion prevention. We know that if there were no, um, if there were no trees there, we would have to intervene. To, if we want to maintain the same amount of erosion, that's not a lot of it, then we have to um, intervene somehow. It could be revegetation, it could be riprap, it could be fencing, and that all comes at a cost. 
So when these trees are doing their are healthy, they're doing their best, they're keeping our banks together, we avoid that cost. So we can, um, so I'll just quick, uh, same for um, fresh water. If fresh water is provided, if water is provided to um, make sure that minimum flow velocity is not, is not met, then that water comes at a cost. It has an opportunity cost of the water that's the price that's traded on the market. So I'll just quickly jump into our results. Um, so this is over the historic climate for a flow for um, the um, flow bands one, four, and seven. So we can see that with the blue is in environmental water delivery, environmental water delivery, and you can see that as if there is a giant, if there's a big flow, take for example the 1956 flood, we expect to see an increase in tree health beyond the point, and as a result, there's an increase in in um, uh, storage value which we can value um, on the market. So that's our top pay, and if we look at our bottom where there's a 20% reallocation, we can see in some cases that we really avoid those troughs. So we're keeping tree health greater by providing a greater amount of flood, flood at the desired return interval. Moving on to erosion prevention, as I mentioned, this is a 45 gigalitre flood per year. It should be quite easy to achieve, and that's certainly the case in the, in the top um, pane, which is our baseline, but there are still some cases where <coughs> tree health declines and so our value declines. Looking at the bottom um, pane, 10% reallocation, this tells us that a very small, a very modest reallocation to the environment actually keeps these trees quite healthy. We won't need to intervene to prevent erosion. And our last one, uh, fresh water value. The top, bar, the top pane we can see, the green bars, are when you would need to intervene to deliver environmental water to prevent blue-green algae, which comes at considerable cost. Water is an expensive commodity. With a 10% reallocation, we can maintain the minimum flow velocity, and that removes the, removes the cost of, of um, intervening. So as a conclusion, um, really the conclusion from this is that Ecosystem, so it proves our hypothesis that ecosystem services are spatially and temporally distributed. Low flows, we know that for optimal health, the Murray-Darling Basin needs um, high and variable flows. But we've shown here that low flows are also quite important and very valuable for provisioning services and regulating services such as the erosion prevention and the blue-green algae prevention. Um, but for the higher floodplains, the higher elevation floodplains, it's considerable reallocation that needs to occur if we want to meet the environmental water requirements all the time. Considerable to the point of greater than 50% in this case. Not politically palatable. So the main um, uh, policy implication for this is that blunt, policy in, blunt uh, reallocation policies can in fact be quite suboptimal if you don't take into account the temporal distribution of these these biophysical processes and the ecosystem services that go with them. So, thank you.